He was light entertainment, a kind of happy song and dance man, a crowd-pleasing minstrel in white face. But when he wiped away the grease paint, we were left with a serious actor of transcendent talent whose compelling performances in and out of the ring were the stuff of high sports and political theater. We join him now in Miami. It's 1964, four years after he won an Olympic gold medal in Rome and only days before a shocking transformation. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Cassius Marcellus Clay. He's young, he's handsome, they know it. He's a poet, a prophet, and many people believe he'll be the next heavyweight champion of the world. He was essentially seen as a trash-talking buffoon. Every picture that you saw of him, he had his mouth wide open and was looking all crazy and out of control. I'm handsome, I'm fast, I'm pretty, and can't possibly be beat. He was a fighter, fine, but he was a performer. He was an artist. He knew not only whether he was losing the fight or winning the fight, but he knew when he was losing the crowd. He put on a show before the fight, he put on a show during it, and after it, he was even better. He changed the way athletes acted with the media and the way the media treated athletes. I'm the greatest. And if you get too smart, I'll knock you out. We had a lot of women, I can tell you that. The night before we fought Joe Bugner, there was a woman in every room on his floor. And he's going from one room to the next. They gravitated towards his swagger. At 19-0, Clay's focus wasn't on women when he trained in Miami Beach for his first title shot against the indomitable heavyweight champion, Sonny Liston. Virtually no one thought that Cassius Clay had a chance to beat Sonny Liston. Certainly Sonny Liston didn't. Sonny Liston was one of the scariest presences on the sporting scene ever. This was a guy who had been arrested probably a hundred times. He was a strong arm man for the mob. I know a lot of guys that completely collapse when they succeed a guy. I saw this and knock a guy's teeth out with a jab. That was a picture of Clay on the cover of Time magazine. Listen, dropped the magazine to the ground, looked at it, and broad daylight pulled out his penis and just urinated on it. <laughs> While Sonny simmered, Clay's training sessions were the stuff of high comedy, drawing a who's who of the entertainment world. Five of us were in this dressing room waiting for Muhammad Ali, and suddenly the door bursts open, and he gathers up all the Beatles, and he says, Okay, Beatles, stick with me, and you'll make some money. It was just a magic moment. The Beatles, Cassius Clay, of this new era in America. And then afterwards, as they're leaving, he turned to me and he said, who are those little faggots? But behind the jokes, Clay was engaged in private consultation with black Muslim leader Malcolm X. A veiled metamorphosis was underway. The butterfly called Cassius was changing his colors. Oh, at the way in. Oh, he went berserk. He was bumping his cane on the ground and wandering around and shouting and screaming. Sonny Liston's eyes wide. Because nobody knows it then, but the only thing Sonny Liston was afraid of was a crazy person. February 25th, 1964, Clay's moment of truth. When he stepped into the ring, he was so bigger than Liston. We haven't figured it out. The challenger Jeremy This eight to one underdog was out running him, out gutting him, and shaming him. Liston had the mentality of a bully, and when someone stood up to him and was outwitting him and out hitting him, he just completely fell apart. When Liston didn't answer the bell for the seventh round, Clay, at 22, was the king of the world.
The next morning, Clay split America in two by confirming his membership in the Nation of Islam. Cassius is not the name no more. Especially Muhammad Ali. Huh? Muhammad Ali. Right. Muhammad Ali. He was probably one of the most hated men in America. He joined a cult that had been presented to most white Americans as racist, a hate group. These guys look very sinister with their bow ties and their grim faces and calling white people devils. But this just seemed nuts to people. I mean, this just seemed absolutely crazy. Well, all of a sudden, the heavyweight champion of the world is preaching what most people think of as a doctrine of hate. Muhammad Ali actually said that any black man about with any white woman should be killed and somebody said to him well that sounds like the lynchings in the south he said right people were repelled uh shot he went from being that witty great likable young guy cassius clay to being something that they simply couldn't cope with after dispatching sonny liston to obscurity in the first round of their rematch in may of 1965 Ali firmly tattooed his name on the heads of two non-believers. He did it with Floyd Patterson and Ernie Terrell, both of whom refused to call him Muhammad Ali. They insisted on calling him Cassius Clay, and he just humiliated them and brutalized them in the ring. It was not a pretty thing to watch. Bob Patterson, one of the jab would say, what's my name? <clears throat> what's my name? <clears throat> and then he refused to knock him out so he could beat him up more. Muhammad Ali is one of the great self-created characters in American history. And I think you have to recognize that some things that you might not like were part of that self-creation. To cast Muhammad Ali as a plaster saint is really absurd and doesn't give the true texture of the story. Additional forces will be needed later, and they will be sent. Mr. Muhammad Ali has just refused to be inducted into the United States Armed Forces. You said you were the people's champion? Yes, sir. Do you think that you're acting like a people's champion? Yes, sir. When he said, I ain't got nothing against them Viet Cong, uh, they ain't never called me nigger. He meant that, and he meant that sincerely. I will not go 10,000 miles to help murder another poor people simply to continue the domination of white slave masters over the darker people of the earth. There is a substantial segment of society that cheered. There was an equally substantial segment that thought that Ali was not only wrong, but engaged in what amounted to treason. This fella they call Clay or Muhammad Ali, whatever he wants to call himself, is a disgrace to the nation. Maybe this boy has forgotten he's black. Let's, let's remind him who's in charge here. The New York Athletic Commission stripped him of his title an hour after he refused induction. In 1967, after nine successful defenses of his heavyweight crown, Ali lost the first round of the biggest fight of his life. But even as his lawyers appealed the decision, a fundamental shift was taking place in America. He spoke for us. I'm a white, middle-class college kid, and that's exactly how I felt. It was almost as if there was this halo over him and people following willingly. He was a damn pot piper. Ali had defied the patriotic precepts of the country by saying, I'm not going to participate in the war effort. He lost three years of his ability as a boxer. He lost three years of income. But once he had paid the price, even people who disagreed with Ali, even people who thought, this is a big blabbermouth, this guy's a lot of hot air, said, you know what, he paid the price. And any time an American pays the price, other Americans say, that's my man. In 1970, the exile ended. After a pair of tune-up fights, Ali met 26-0 Joe Frazier the following year at Madison Square Garden. Ali looked at Frazier as the sellout. Guy had sold out to the white establishment, become champion. Ali couldn't fight. For well, Joe Frazier to be a champion, he's got to beat me. He branded Joe Frazier and Uncle Tom in a way that was very cruel. 
But it wasn't done by accident. It was done to gain a psychological advantage. For him to be viewed as a white, um, sucking Uncle Tom kind of guy was the greatest insult you could give a guy who is nothing but raging black. That was the setting for the first one. And it was the most electrifying event that I've ever been at. The anticipation, two undefeated champions, two champions of the first rank, and Ali coming back to reclaim in many people's minds what was rightly his, but not against some patsy, against Joe Frazier. I had one focus, the butterfly. Styles make fights, and they never were two more contrasting styles that would work to give you a great fight than Joe Frazier bobbing in left hand at work, and Muhammad Ali pinpointing his punches to Frazier's head. The young Muhammad Ali would have run circles around Joe Frazier, but it wasn't the young Ali who got in the ring with Joe. He lost an incredible amount of sharpness. He lost the quickness and the ability to avoid a punch. In the 15th round, Muhammad Ali went down from a bodacious left hook, his eyes spinning in his head. And he could have stayed there, been counted out, but he didn't. He got up and took some more beating. Muhammad Ali has never taken such a battery. He didn't feel that he was fighting only for himself. He felt that he was fighting for everybody who believed in him. March 8, 71, I cried my eyeballs out. Cried my eyeballs out. Not just because he lost, but because he symbolized so much. It wasn't about sports. It was about wars, it's about race, it's about politics, it's about society, it's about generations. And the feeling was that if Ali lost, then, then we were wrong. of Sports Century, the top 50 and beyond. Joe DiMaggio, Monday at 8, Stories of a Lifetime on ESPN Classic. Hi, I'm Dan Patrick, and you're watching a special Sports Century Marathon right here on ESPN Classic. George Foreman, it was the first list to fight all over again. Ali looked like he was a fading champion who didn't have the speed anymore, who took a lot of punches, and who was about to get back down. My biggest worry is where were we going to take him when he got hurt? Although he beat Joe Frazier in the rematch nine months earlier, it was clear Ali was not as sharp. But his genius for psyching out opponents had improved with time. We were sitting with Jack Dempsey, and George walked in. George starts staring at Ali, and Ali got up. He said, Sonny, listen, this, this, you're a little bitty boy. You think I'm scared of you? You're nothing. I'll whip your butt right here. And Foreman walked away, and Ali sat down, looked at Jack Dempsey. He said, I just won round one. But round one would have to wait. A cut over Foreman's eye delayed the fight five weeks. And in that time, Ali marshaled millions. They had a rally to see the two fighters. Ali got out on the running track and started calling the people, and he had found out how to say kill it in their language, which was Boumaye. Muhammad got that Ali Boumaye chant going right from the get-go. He was the hero. The other guy was the enemy. George was the enemy. So by fight time, I doubt that there were more than a handful of people in Zaire who weren't rooting for Ali. goes up on his toe. Bang! Hits him with that first shot. Now, what does Foreman do with the gloves? Cuts the ring off. Ali goes back on the ropes. We're screaming at him in the corner. Don't stand still. Don't let this guy stand in front of you. He hits George. Then he goes back on the ropes. The rope do The rope do Come on, George. You ain't nothing. Show me something. George is throwing punches. Bang, bang, bang. George Foreman got exhausted. He missed a lot of shots. And he was catching arms and everything else. So this what emptied George Foreman's tank. Missing. I 
hit him hard in the side. I mean, I got a good shot. And he said, is that all you got, George? And I remember thinking, yep, that's about it. And not more than 20 minutes after the fight was over, the mom soon hit. And it hit really hard. There was flickering of lightning along the horizon. And we all went back in this uh, entourage of cars to uh, the hotels in Kinshasa. And all along the road were uh, the Africans standing in the rain, leaping up and down and shouting, Ali Bomaye, Bomaye, thousands and thousands and thousands. As Ali drove by, people started holding up their children so they would be able to say to them, you saw Muhammad Ali the night that he regained the heavyweight championship of the world. Eleven months later, Ali arrived in the Philippines to defend his title and settle the rubber match with his nemesis, Joe Frazier. It will be a killer and a chiller and a thriller when I get the gorilla in Manila. Manila wasn't about the heavyweight championship of the world. There was something much more important at stake. Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier were fighting for the heavyweight championship of each other. They both understood that whoever won this fight, that's who history was going to recognize as the greater fighter. Frazier's smiling as Ali talked to him. Really, it was a fight in three parts. The first part, Ali is just whipping on Fraser. I mean, he's tagging him, he's tagging him. Somehow, in the middle rounds, Fraser comes through. Fraser starts wailing, he cuts off the ring, he gets him on the ropes. He was killing Ali. Ali tried to regain the psychological edge by looking at him and saying, Joe Frazier, they told me you were washed up. And Frazier said, they told you wrong, pretty boy. Closest to life and death I've ever seen. To equally match fighters at the top of their form with an intense competitive edge on each other. Not dislike, actual edge of hatred, if you will. It didn't seem that you could survive that. By the 12th round, Ali had regained his mastery over Joe Frazier. It was now a question of whether he could last. It looked like Ali was going to have to quit in the corner because he was getting so beat up. He said, I feel like I'm dying. This must be what death feels like. Frazier could not see. And Ali knew what he had to do to win. And he could keep wailing away at will with that jab in his eyes. I think it's going to be over. It's all over. It was a climax to Ali's career. And he collapsed right on the campus at that point. He had nothing left to give. After that fight, I was up in a suite, and the blood red sun was dropping over Manila Bay. He took my hand and moved it across his forehead, and there was just a ridge of bumps, terrible bumps, and he just said, why I do this? Sports fans go first for sports. To get ESPN now, call your cable company. When we return, two years after beating Leon Spinks to become the first three-time heavyweight champion, a 38-year-old Muhammad Ali comes out of retirement to face Larry Holmes. This is Jenkins, and this is ESPN Plus. We're in the best fight for you, guys. old school. Hi, I'm Dan Patrick, and you're watching a special Sports Century Marathon right here on ESPN Classic. But the only thing that makes Muhammad Ali like other fighters is the fact that he went on way too long. The people who really cared for him pleaded with him to quit after Manila and instead he fought five more years. It was hubris, I guess, and he, he just couldn't push himself out of the limelight. In this 
sight of him holding an Olympic torch would bring people to tears. He won a lot of bets. He won a lot of bets. He doesn't feel sorry for himself, and there's no reason for anybody else to feel sorry for him. A very satisfied life. He does exactly what he wants to do when he wants to do it. God has blessed him many times over and continues to bless him. So there's nothing for him not to be happy about. The little boy came to the camp to meet Ali. Ali looked at the boy. Why do you wear a skull cap? The boy said, Ali, I got cancer. I have chemo. I lost all my hair. Ali hugged the boy, and Ali told the little boy, I'm going to beat George Foreman, and you're going to beat cancer. Two weeks later, Ali and I went down to see the boy. We heard he was in bad shape. And when we walked in, Ali said, I told you I'm going to beat George Foreman, and you're going to beat cancer. And the little boy looked Ali in the eyes with his big blue eyes, and he said, no, champ, I'm going to meet God, and I'm going to tell him I know you. two decades, Muhammad Ali used his physical and mental brilliance to shake up the world. Now he's a captive of his own body, unable to move with range, unable to rap with flair. The man who spoke for half the world now rests quietly on a secluded farm in Michigan. For Sports Century's 50 Greatest Athletes, I'm Dan Patrick. This has been a